The world marks 70 years since the most brutal Nazi death camp was liberated by the Red Army. Tensions running high at a UN Security Council emergency meeting over Ukraine as Russia and the US trade accusations of meddling in the crisis. And the FBI claims it's busted a Russian spy ring in New York. One man's been arrested, but he denies all accusations. Welcome to the program here on RT International. I'm Rory Suchet with your top world headlines. World leaders and Holocaust survivors are gathering today in Auschwitz, Poland. They're marking 70 years since the infamous concentration camp was liberated back in January 1945. Earlier at a remembrance ceremony in Berlin, Chancellor Angela Merkel acknowledged the role Soviet troops played in freeing the camp. The Jahrestag der Befreiung des Lagers Auschwitz Birkenau durch sowjetische Soldaten jährt sich morgen zum 70. Mal. Was geschehen ist, erfüllt uns Deutsche mit großer Scham. Denn es waren Deutsche, die das Leid und den Tod von Millionen Menschen verschuldet oder in Kauf genommen haben. Wir wollen keine hasserfüllten Parolen gegen angeblich Ungläubige oder Andersgläubige. Auschwitz has indeed become a symbol of the hatred that human beings are capable of. It was known as the most brutal network of death camps operated across World War II. Adolf Hitler's regime ran it for five years in Nazi-occupied Poland, and more than a million people, most of them European Jews, perished there in gas chambers or as a result of starvation, forced labor, disease or medical experiments. And in the near future, here on the program, on RT International, we will go straight to Auschwitz and join Paula Sleer as the commemorations get underway on this solemn day. For now, though, here on the program in eastern Ukraine, shelling has continued in Donetsk throughout the night and into the morning. All that comes as the north of the city has lost power and heating. Emergency teams often have to halt the work because of the ongoing violence. And the region was plunged into war once again over a week ago when the army renewed its assault on the area around Donetsk airport held by anti-government fighters. The UN Security Council assembled on Monday to discuss the deteriorating situation in the region and accusations came flying from all directions about who is fueling the violence. RT's Marina Portnaya reports. U.S. envoy Samantha Power accused Russia of resupplying the rebels over recent weeks with hundreds of pieces of military equipment and advanced missile air defense systems. Uh, that charge Moscow has vehemently denied. Now, Russian envoy to the U.N. Ambassador Cherkin says Moscow condemns and mourns all civilian victims. But he says Western countries who support Kyiv conveniently ignore all the blood and tragedy the Ukrainian government is responsible for. Ukrainian armed forces have shelled the largest city in the Donetsk region, the city of Donetsk, almost continuously since the beginning of January. At least 27 civilians have died over the last seven Seven days. Last week was the worst experienced in Holovka since summer. 107 people died, nine of them children. Artillery fire from multiple rocket launching systems bombarded the city of Stakhanov in the Lugansk region. It's estimated 10 civilians died on the 21st of January. Last week, an agreement brokered by Germany and France was reached that required both sides of the Ukrainian conflict to begin withdrawing he heavy weaponry uh, in eastern Ukraine. Now, Moscow says Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko breached the agreement by continuing to shell populated areas which then prompted the militia forces to respond. In the meantime, the question of why Kiev's allies are failing to condemn any of the army's violations, that was also raised at the daily State Department briefing in Washington. You have not, that I can recall yet, accused or condemned any action by the government of Kiev, the government in Kiev, for violations which you say 
or I don't know. I mean, are there no violations on the on well, the this government sounds side? Similar to what Russia I, today was asking last week. Well, they, right, but I mean, if you is look, is there a specific violation that we're talking about that we should discuss? You're very. The U.S. is very quick to condemn the separatist side and the, the for violations of the Minsk Agreement. That, and and your uh, your allegations about them, which may or may not, which you say have been proven by by the OSCE. Uh, are fine, but the Russians make their own allegations. And you're saying that all of those are flat out wrong? Well, they're, and all of they're yours standing are alone while the rest of the international community is right. on the other side with a different understanding of what's happening. And as promised, we're going back to one of our main stories today, that of the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz death camp. Let's go straight to Poland now. Our correspondent, Paul Islia, is standing by to give us the very latest on these are commemorations that are getting underway now on this very solemn day, Paula. Yes, the Polish president has laid a wreath at the wall of death in the Auschwitz camp, which is around five kilometers from where I'm standing. I'm in Birkenau, which is the main part of the camp. This is where the trains arrived, where the selections took place, and where four crematoria operated nonstop. Later today, the main ceremony will take place here in Birkenau. There are delegations representing some 42 countries. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, however, will not be attending. He was not formally invited by the Warsaw government in his place will be Sergei Ivanov, who is the chief of staff of the Russian presidential administration. Now, when Russian President Putin was here 10 years ago, there were 1,500 survivors who took part in the commemoration. Today, there are only 300, and this is why organizers are saying that in all likelihood, this will be the last large gathering of Auschwitz survivors. Many of these survivors have been critical of the decision not to formally invite the Russian president, saying, of course, that it was the Red Army who liberated this camp 70 years ago today. The Russians liberated the camp. The Russians liberated the camp, not the Americans, not uh, the, the Russians. And makes sense that uh, people of the government, uh, if not Putin, has to be is to be there, it's obvious. The decision by the Polish government not to invite the Russian president to the ceremony marking 70 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz death camp is a scandal. How can you fail to invite the leader of a country that fought against Nazi Germany and liberated Auschwitz? 1.4 million people died in Auschwitz-Birkenau. The majority of them were Jews. And in addition to the ceremony that will take place here, there will be events around the world today marking this historic moment. Right, Nazis, Paul Lea, they're reporting from Auschwitz in Poland. Thank you. Well, we are closely following all the remembrance ceremonies happening today in Poland, on air and online at rt.com. For now on the program, the leading American credit rating agency Standard & Poor's has reduced Russia's status to junk, putting it below investment grade for the first time in a decade. The agency said the downgrade was due to the country's economic slowdown amid Western sanctions and the falling oil price. Well, the Russian finance minister called the downgrade pessimistic. He said Standard & Poor's is ignoring the positives, including the country's enormous foreign currency reserves an extraordinarily low debt burden. Well, we spoke to the former Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, Paul Craig Roberts. He thinks decisions taken by credit rating agencies very often have political overtones. Ruling by the Standard & Poor's and the other U.S. rating agencies are political rulings. They don't mean anything, and they are absurd. If we look at the debt, the Russian debt as a percent of Russian gross domestic product is 11 percent. That must be the lowest in the world. Per citizen, it comes to $1,645. Now let's look at the American situation. The American debt as a percent of U.S. GDP is 105 percent, 10 times larger. So. Who should have their credit rating downgraded? 
And the oil price dipped further on Monday after the world's largest crude exporter, Saudi Arabia, confirmed it has no plans to cut production. The plummeting prices, though, now hitting crude producers all around the world. The U.S. state of Alaska feeling the pinch. The new governor, Bill Walker, has announced drastic budget cuts due to the shortfall in oil revenue, which makes up most of the state budget. He joined my colleague Matt Trezor to discuss the likely impact. It's created a deficit a situation of about three and a half billion dollars, and so for this for this coming year, so it's a, it's a significant impact. You've announced sizable budget cuts, including uh, to schools and social services. Do you think there could be any kind of backlash from this? What public response are you expecting? You know, I don't think so because I mean, there's certainly going to be, but we've done a good job of, of making sure Alaskans understand the, the fiscal situation that we're in. And so they're they're uh, they're aware they know what I know, and so I think that uh, I think that they're more more resilient because of our open and transparent uh, process. What kind of alternatives are you thinking of in order to come up with uh, in order to fill this gap? For example, I understand that Alaska has no uh, sales tax or income tax. Are you coming up with any kind of creative ways around this? You know, I'm sure at some point that will be more traditional sources of of revenue will be considered. But right now we're in the process of sort of looking at. You know, what can we consolidate, what we can make do more efficiently, et cetera, and sort of make some reductions first. And we think that's the, the, the correct priority before we start looking at more sources of revenue. Um, so that's what we're doing now, looking at the, uh, the expense side. The victory of the anti-austerity Syriza party in the Greek election was no surprise. But the third place of far-right Golden Dawn, that did raise a few eyebrows. The party, which is said to be Nazi-inspired, secured its place in Parliament with 6.3% of the vote, despite its leaders currently being stuck behind bars. Party members, though, are facing charges for running a criminal organization, arms possession and arson. The investigation started after a Golden Dawn supporter was held over the stabbing of an anti-racist rapper in 2013. The party denies neo-Nazi ties, though its logo does somewhat resemble a swastika, and senior officials have publicly praised Adolf Hitler. At one point, Golden Dawn advocated the use of landmines to stop illegal immigrants from entering the country. We spoke to Greek journalist Maria Psara. She thinks the Greeks who gave their support to the party know exactly what they're voting for. Golden Dawn has stable members, stable voters. The Golden Dawn ideology about ras, racism, fascism is strong in the Greek society. I cannot imagine that the voter of Golden Dawn doesn't know about uh, these beliefs and doesn't support it. There is a lot of publicity in Greece about Golden Dawn and the real ideas of Golden Dawn and nobody can say that I don't know. Golden Dawn's anti-austerity views took a back seat during this election. They were better represented by the victorious far-left Syriza party. Syriza's pledges to scrap the crippling austerity measures and cancel a vast chuck of the uh, country's enormous debt, that did win them a decisive majority. Our In the Now program spoke to senior lecturer in politics, Alexander Kazamias, about Syriza's campaign promises. So far, uh, Syriza and its leader Alexis Tsipras have shown uh, unprecedented determination in supporting their uh, program. A uh, absurd cycle of austerity that is increasing the Greek debt instead of reducing it should have to stop. And Brussels don't want these changes. Are we going to see a fight? Uh, we are going to see a tough negotiation. And uh, it is difficult to predict the outcome of this negotiation. However, Greek election in itself has changed the climate. It has put the question of the Eurozone crisis and the austerity policies of the past five years very high up on the agenda. In addition, of course, it has encouraged other southern European states, especially in Spain, to begin to rethink the policies that have been adopted over the past few years. And we can see this in the growing popularity of Podemos in the country, which uh, tops the opinion polls for quite some time and could win uh, an election in Spain later this year.
for joining us here on RT International today. Uh, nearly quarter past 12 in the early afternoon in Moscow. After a very small break, bringing you the latest details of a spy scandal brewing in New York.